Tammy Cleveland was determined to hold on to her husband. Her husband, Michael, was out shopping and dropped over with a heart attack. He was rushed to the hospital where the doctor pronounced him dead, and Tammy had given up hope. The coroner came in to pick up Michael's body, and he moved. He was still alive. He summoned for the doctor to come back in. The doctor took Michael into intensive care. And all at once, Tammy had hope. Hope beyond belief. The next morning, they did heart surgery on him and lost him. Hope was gone. I don't know if any of us can fathom that kind of a roller coaster ride to have no hope. And then have hope, and then hope is gone permanently. Now, most all of us here and those listening online have lost someone dear to us, at least a friend. We've been exposed or experienced death. And when it's, the person is close to you, you, you can't convey that pain that you go through. It's horrible. And usually the degree of pain that we experience has to do with the closeness relationship that we have with the person. If, if the person is really close to us, there's an unbelievable amount of pain. If it's, if it's a distant person or relative, then we don't experience much. But you can't describe it until you've been through it and been there. In my more ignorant past of many, many, many years ago, uh, I would watch someone lose a relative and a year later or so, I'm, I'm like, well, can't they get over it? Why do they still have the room untouched? Or why, is the, why are they telling about the clothes that they've not been able to touch? And then, as I experienced it, yeah, you can't describe it. If you've not been there, you can't describe it. I realize we're tarting off on a sour note this morning. But I really think that we have to experience the grieving and the pain of losing someone to get an idea what it must have been like for those three days of the death of Jesus Christ, their Savior, their, their friend, their teacher, their, their master. And for three days, they had no clue of what was about to come. Resurrection Day. Resurrection Day, the, the, the song service and Marty's special, it's all about the fact that Jesus is alive. He's raised from the dead. And you can just imagine on that Sunday morning 2,000 years ago when the disciples were all moping and gloomy and grieving Jesus' death. And then they learned that he was alive. But let's bring this 2,000 years closer to us. Jesus is alive. And it's not only today that we worship and celebrate this on Resurrection Sunday, but it's every Sunday, every time that we meet as the church. Whatever day it is, whatever hour it is, whatever place it is, Jesus is alive, and we celebrate that, his resurrection. He's alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. And last Sunday, we talked about his crucifixion. And then Friday, this, this past Good Friday, Good because he died for us. We talked about his crucifixion then also and, and experienced it in drama form. And, and through these lessons that we learned last Sunday and on, on this past Friday, we talked about how Jesus endured such an unfair trial, a biased jury of religious leaders, the top leaders in Israel, and they, they were determined they're going to kill this guy. And they handed him off to Pilate. And Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. There was no guilt in him, but yet Pilate found himself between a, what we call a rock and a hard place. He needed a, a relationship with the Israelite leaders that hated him. Tiberius, the emperor, didn't like Pilate either. 
And Pilate was afraid, well, if he doesn't crucify Jesus, doesn't somehow satisfy the religious leaders, then the religious leaders were going to go to Tiberias, and, Ty and Pilate was going to lose his job as governor, and everything was going to go downhill. So despite the fact Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, he turned him over to be crucified. And on that day that he was crucified, when he was finally dead, they had to hurry and bury him because their Sabbath began on the evening of Friday and then would go through Saturday till Saturday evening. And so they were not permitted to, to do certain things on the Sabbath. And so they hurriedly prepared Jesus' body for burial, didn't get it completely done, and then put him in the tomb and it was sealed. And so Sunday morning was the first opportunity that anyone had to go to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. And so we find the ladies working their way to the tomb on that Sunday morning. Now they knew they confronted one problem, and that was the fact that the, the stone was rolled in front of the tomb, and how were they going to roll that away? Now the problem that they might not have known about is the, the regards to prevent anybody from going in the tomb or taking the body or whatever might happen. And so we're going to read in Matthew's gospel what took place as the ladies got to the tomb and learn of Jesus' resurrection. Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now, if, if, if you've lost a loved one close to you, you understand. The ladies probably couldn't sleep. They probably hadn't slept too much in the last couple days, the last couple nights. You know that sleep flees from you when you're grieving. Oh, they probably got a little bit of shut eye, but then wake up and cry. Talk, fall back to sleep, wake up and cry. You know the, the, the process. But they needed to finish preparing Jesus' body for permanent burial. They may have been talking the last couple of days how they were going to do it and what time they might get up in the, on, on Sunday morning and get to the tomb and, and how they were going to complete the process. So on dawn, that Sunday morning, according to Matthew, two ladies went to the tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Now, scholars aren't certain which Mary they're talking about. It could be uh, presumably the mother of James and Joses, however you pronounce that last name. Or it could have been Mary, the mother of James and John. There were a lot of Marys back then, if you get that drift. But scholars think it's likely the Mary, the mother of James and Joses. The other gospel writers say there were other women also. So at least two, possibly more, probably more. And Matthew says there was an earthquake. Now, it wasn't just any earthquake. It was a violent earthquake. I wonder if, if God was trying to wake up Jerusalem or all of Judea or all of Israel. Was it felt throughout the entire region like earthquakes do today? I mean, it can be, it can be hundreds of miles away and, and yet felt elsewhere. We don't know what the purpose of the earthquake was, but at that time is when the angel of the Lord came. Came from heaven. He went to the tomb and rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
Now, what I want to ask us to do this morning is I want, I want us to use our imagination. I want us to imagine that we're there. And keep imagining that throughout the message and just, just think that you're there. What, what would you be experiencing? When did this earthquake happen? Were the ladies on the way to the tomb at the time? We, we don't know, but we can assume that they must have felt it. I mean, Matthew wrote about it, so it happened. Too many times we read the Bible and we've heard the stories and we just kind of fly past them. Especially last Sunday we talk about the crucifixion and Good Friday we talk about the crucifixion. It's old stuff to us. We know what happens. Sunday's coming. We get to, to this day, Resurrection Sunday, and we know what's coming. And so we just kind of let it go in one ear and out the other. So use your imagination. What would it be time? Yeah, what would it be like? You know, we've experienced earthquakes here, right? I can remember one on the farm that the, the, the shed creaked a little bit, and I was like, I wonder, was that an earthquake? The radio came on a little bit later. We just had an earthquake, and, and there was one a few years ago, and I, we, we experienced But this was nothing like what they would experience when this was a violent earthquake. I think God got people's attention. So use your imagination as I reread some of this scripture. We'll go through it and, and describe it a little bit. Matthew chapter 28, verse 3 says, His appearance, that is the angel, was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. This angel was magnificent, at least to the women, and terrifying to the guards, magnificent to those that believed, and horrifying to those that did not believe. Now, we have to wonder, did the women understand what they were seeing? I mean, they probably hadn't slept. They were tired, exhausted. Tears were probably in their eyes, and, and they're completely oblivious as to what they're seeing and what's going on. But they saw this angel, still in shock from Jesus' death. It, how, would, how would you comprehend that? What would you think if you were there? And the angel spoke to them. Now, keep your imagination going. Verse 5. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Now, those of us that have lost someone close to us, I mean really close, what would we think if a vision or an angel or somebody told us that your loved one was no longer dead? Now, I know we've got a process of funeral homes and embalming or cremation and, and, and burying them, but whatever the situation, what would you think if you got to realize they were really alive? I mean, he's alive or, or she's alive. That'd be overwhelming. Would you, would you believe what you were hearing? Could you believe what you were seeing? It'd be, it'd be a fantasy. They had seen Jesus raise others from the dead, but none of the disciples had any clue that he himself was going to come back from the grave. Not one of his disciples, followers of any kind, believed Jesus was going to come back from the grave. Just to make certain the women understood that what the angel was telling them, he said, hey, come look inside. Now, the women had probably been there, or we know they were there when Jesus was buried. They probably went inside, as you and I would go inside with someone that we're, we're close to that we lost, and, and one last look. Now, he would have been covered. Maybe, you know, the face was covered already, but... You take that one last look. You had seen Jesus in the tomb. You saw it. You knew he was there. So the angel says, come on inside. And they saw that he was gone. Now, don't stop imagining. Keep it going. But let's change the image. What would you do if this were 
your friend, spouse, child, parent. And I realize that what I'm talking about this morning has got to be painful for some of you, having not lost a loved one not that long ago. But, but it's in the pain, it's in this grieving that we can start to understand what it must have been like for the women and the disciples that Sunday morning. See, the sting of death is for the person that's died. It'll be for us when we die. But the sting of death is also for the loved ones left behind. The hole in our hearts, the grieving, the, the loneliness. The loneliness. You know that feeling if you've lost a loved one. The memories are so real, and, and occasionally you, you, you turn around to talk to them, and just in that split second, they were alive again, and then in that other fragment of the second, you realize, no, they're not. Such joy and such pain in just that one second of time. And then you realize they're in the grave. They're gone. And you know that if they're Christians and you're a Christian, you know you're going to, you're going to see them again someday. But that seems like so far in the distant future. And so your heart continues to hurt. So how can we somehow grasp what the angel was telling these women? He's alive. He's not here. See, we're, as I said, we're dulled by this resurrection story because we've heard it so many times. We know how it ends. So just think about that time that you lost a loved one. Parent, child, spouse, the dear friend. And try to put yourself where these women were. Now, I think the, the angel told the women what, what I think is the most absurd part of the story Go tell his disciples. Well, yeah, that's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. Now it makes sense. Go tell the disciples that go to Galilee where he's going to meet you. But go tell the disciples. Where, where else, what else are they going to do? They're going to run to tell the disciples. I think if it was me, I could have set the fastest uh, sprint time in history to go and tell them that he's alive. What would you have done? What, what would you do if it was your loved one? And you were told he or she is gone. He's alive. She's alive. But in this case, he, Jesus, is alive. He's alive. He's alive. I think I'd be shouting. I'd be, I'd be jumping. I'd be dancing. I'd be singing. I'd be kissing everything in sight. Just like that guy in the old song, Love Potion Number 9. Just so happy, so thrilled. Everything's gone right. Now, for those of you that are young, he kissed the cow down on 34th and Vine, and the cow broke his bottle of love pushing number nine. After the services, don't do it now. Go ahead and YouTube it. Enjoy the song. But, but that's the kind of thrill that we would be experiencing for our loved ones, and that's the kind of thrill that we should be experiencing about Jesus Christ, because he is alive. Jesus is alive. And, and is that significant? Well, Yeah. Do you realize that the most two significant events in all of human history, at least, took place within three days of each other? Jesus' death and resurrection are the most significant events in history. And since I can't see outside of human history, I, I'm assuming it's the most significant events in all of history. And see, you can't have one without the other. You, you can't have Jesus' death... without the resurrection. Death gives us salvation, but without the resurrection, there's no life after death. Jesus' resurrection validates everything that he taught. Now, we're going to go through uh, six quick points here. They're not on the screen, so you might want to write them down. If you want to write them down, just write down that Jesus' resurrection shows or proves, and then there'll just be a couple of lines you can, or a couple of words you can write after that. So number one, Jesus' resurrection shows that Jesus has power over death. His resurrection shows that he has power over death. And he passes that on to us. Not that we will ever have power over death, but we will have the opportunity to be raised by Jesus, if we're followers of him, to life. 
So he gives this that opportunity because he resurrected from the dead and has that power over death. Number two, Jesus' resurrection proves the truth of the gospel. Everything that Jesus taught, everything that he did, everything that he said was validated because he raised from the dead. Had he not raised, it would invalidate everything that he said. Destroy this temple. In three days I will rebuild it. That was his death and resurrection. He came back to life three days later. Number three, Jesus' resurrection proves that he is God's son. Nobody else has come back to life. God and Jesus are one. Jesus and God are one. Now, we talk about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but Jesus, in his life and teaching, taught about he and his Father, his Father and him. So his resurrection proves that he's God's Son, and Jesus' resurrection gives us hope. Hope. Where would we be without hope? Hope is what carries us through. Until you stop and think about it, you don't realize it. Think about that time that you were sick or in pain. Or in the misery of losing a loved one. It's always darkest and most painful and, and, and lonely when it's in the middle of the night. And we can't wait for sunrise. We're so much better. When Jesus died, the disciples were in the darkest hour of their life because they had lost hope. But his resurrection on that morning gave them hope again. If you've lost your loved one, you know what that destruction of hope is. And the only hope you have, which is, which is great, is if they were a Christian and you're a Christian, you will see them again. And that's the only hope that we've got at that point a lot of times. You know, we have no idea what hell is going to be like, and we don't want to experience it. We don't want to be there. But those outside of Christ will experience hell. And what do we know about hell? Well, it's going to be painful beyond imagination. Fire. I mean, that's the last way I ever want to die. A lot of Christians were burned to death. That's pain. And the only hope in that case is that that you die. But you're in hell. If you're in hell, there is no hope. Eternal punishment. Eternal pain forever and ever and ever. I can imagine heaven. I cannot fathom pain forever and ever. And the other thing about hell is you're going to be lonely. You're going to have the absence of God. You're going to experience the absence of God. And even in our our worst pain and trials here, we still have God with us. Even when we feel like he's left us, he's still with us. And hell will be not only pain, it will be the absence of God. And I don't know which is going to be worse, the pain or the absence. But no hope. No hope. But Jesus, for those of us in Christ, gives us hope. We don't have to worry about hell. We don't have to worry about experiencing it. His resurrection saves us from hell if we accept him and gives us hope. Number five, Jesus' resurrection means that Christians will be raised from the dead as Jesus was raised from the dead. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead. First means that those of us who follow him and believe in him, we're going to be raised too. He is the first, but he will not be the last raised from the dead. And you and I can be raised also. Number six, Jesus' resurrection means that we too will triumph over death. What does that mean? Well, let's give an example. In John chapter 11, John tells about Jesus' friend, Lazarus. Jesus was a friend of Lazarus, and Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. Lazarus got sick, and so Martha and Mary sent this word to Jesus, who was far off, your friend Lazarus is dead. Come, kill him, come. Well, Jesus stayed where he was at, and he, he was late. Lazarus died. Now, no, Jesus wasn't late. Jesus is never late. He planned it. It's in his time. But when he got there, Martha kind of chastised him. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. 
So in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus responds to Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He, he said, we have hope. If we believe in him, we have hope. If we love him, we have hope. If we obey him, we have hope. Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead. You and I have hope that we will be next. That was a gift for Martha, Mary, and they didn't understand it, but it was a, a, a gift for Lazarus also. And he, he, Jesus ended by asking Martha that simple question, do you believe this? And what was Martha's answer? Well, we go to verse 27. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now we kind of got sidetracked. Let, let's, let's go back to the scripture and get your imagination going again. The women left the grave, and while they were, I'm assuming, running or hurrying on their way to tell the disciples, guess who they met? Jesus. Jesus appeared to them. And, and he's a simple greeting. Seems kind of bland to me, but not to them, because they greeted him, they worshipped him, they, they clasped his feet, and they worshipped. He was not only risen from the dead in the flesh, but they recognized him as the Messiah. They worshipped. It, it wasn't just Jesus is back. They worshipped him. Somehow they were connecting the dots at that point. Later that same day, Jesus appeared to the disciples, and they hadn't believed either. I mean, the women told him they weren't believing. Would we? <laughs> Sound like a tall story to us, wouldn't it? But Jesus appeared to them, and ten of the disciples were there at the time. Uh, Judas is dead. Thomas wasn't there. And they saw him and believed. Now, Thomas came later and said, no way, I'm not going to believe it. No way. I've got to see and I've got to feel the, those uh, scars from the nails. <laughs> For some reason, Jesus made Thomas wait an entire week. Think about that, entire week. Now, by that time, the disciples, they might be starting to question, did we really see what we thought we saw? Now, we don't know, but there, there's been some pretty amazing things I've seen. And then sometime later, I think, did I really see that or was that a dream? But there was a group of them there, so they understood. And so the week later, Thomas is there with them, and Jesus appears. And it, it didn't take Thomas long to believe. So Thomas believed also. But, you know, that's, that's a 2,000-year-old story. That's a question that applies to us today. Do we believe? Do I believe Jesus is alive today? Now, personalize it. Personalize it. Now, so, so, some of you guys are lazy, you, you husbands, because you're letting your, your wives fill everything out. The question is for every one of us, me included. Do I believe Jesus is alive today? Second question, do I accept Jesus as my Savior? Ah, sorry, do I accept Jesus as Savior? Do I accept Jesus as Savior? Just because you believe he's a Savior doesn't mean he's your Savior. So, third point, my Savior? Do you believe and accept Jesus as your Savior, as my Savior? You can reject believing in Jesus as though he never lived. You can reject believing in Jesus as though he died and resurrected. You can reject believing Jesus as a Savior. You know, if, if, if somebody is drowning, let's say you're drowning. Somebody jumps in, they rescues you. That person is, in a way, your Savior, not my Savior. So, see, Jesus could be somebody else's Savior, but not your Savior. So, the question is, you can reject Jesus as your Savior, is that what you're going to do? Or you can accept Jesus as your Savior. What will you do with that? See, God designed salvation kind of strange to us. Jesus went as far as he could. Did everything in his power to save us, but 
We've got to respond to that. Now think about this. God could have put it in your DNA and my DNA to automatically love Jesus and automatically accept him. Now, if I can speak in human terms, it's in God's DNA to automatically love us as a, as a parent loves the child. But he did not put it in our DNA to automatically love him. So, so think about a, a human relationship. If, if someone were programmed to love you, and no matter what you did, they'd still love you, that'd be cheap. That'd be a robot-type love. It wouldn't be love at all. It's not love until you receive love. Or until you give your love to somebody else. That's what makes love so precious. And so God gives us a choice. God gives us a choice. Do we love him? Do we love Jesus? Love is a choice. God chose to love you and he asks that we love him. So th this question is, is, of course, for someone who's not a Christian. Do, do you love Jesus? Do, do you accept him as your Savior? Will you, will you take him as your Savior? But it's not only a question for those who are outside of Christ. It's also a question for us who are in Christ. Is Jesus my Savior? Is Jesus your Savior? Do you live like Jesus is your Savior? Do you love others like Jesus is your Savior? Do you obey Jesus as your Savior? See, this is where it gets tough for us because we don't always live in love and obey like Jesus is our Savior. So if you're outside of Christ today, you have an opportunity to come to him. It's easy. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he lived, he died, and he lives again. He was resurrected. And to simply repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's our choice what we will do because that's the way God designed it. Jesus came as far as he could. What are you going to do with Jesus? Let's pray. Our Father, <laughs> you've got a strange way of loving us that you gave your son. You, you created us knowing what Jesus was going to do. He willingly knew what he was going to do before you even created us. You knew we were going to fail. You knew it was going to cost him his life. He knew it was going to cost him his life. But the strange love is that knowing he still came, lived, suffered, went through a horrible trial, totally illegal, totally illogical, but they hated him that much, and he loved them that much. He went to the cross, he died, but Sunday was coming, because Jesus is alive. He's gone as far as he can, now the question is, what will we do this morning? The baptistry's ready for anybody that will come to repent and be baptized. Thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. Help us not forget. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.